that way up will run back to sleep. So kind of acknowledge the sound and I can drop back to sleep. But over the last couple of weeks I've noticed, especially on the various networks and the news and things, that talk about preparing for the coming year and things to look out for, things to be mindful of. And basically the idea they put forth was kind of looking at things and might uh, you might be afraid of, but you're not afraid it might take place. And, and as, as I was hearing those things repeatedly, I was, I was mindful of one of the things that, that I read in the Bible many times, and uh, at least we find in Matthew's account. Here they will look at Mark's, but it's also in Luke's. There's different times in the Bible we find events that have taken place that some are interesting and some are a little bit scary. And Mark 5 is one of those things that's a little bit unsettling when you read about the, the demon-possessed men, and Matthew points out, we'll talk about later, how he says there's two men coming out of the tombs who are possessed by evil spirits. Now, I've seen a lot of scary movies over the years. I enjoy them from time to time. Um, if you've ever watched scary movies with me, you probably find them pretty enjoyable because I'm one who jumps and makes noises when something pops out or whatever it may be. Um, but Mark chapter 5 is one of those occasions where it is something that is, to me, at least unsettling when you read about the man coming out of the tombs. There's a reason why a lot of scary events in movies sometimes center around, especially in horror movies, center around a cemetery. Because cemeteries, at least in the evening, are known to, for some to be in many places kind of scary. There's no place where you can really go and spend time. It's a scary place to be, and usually we're there because we're mourning over someone who had recently passed from this life. And in Mark chapter 5, we read about two men. Mark only talks about one. We'll talk about why that, that may be here a little bit more. But in Mark chapter 5, we read about this occasion where two men come out of the tombs who are possessed by evil spirits. Sometimes they're referred to as evil spirits, sometimes they're referred to as demons, as a reference to the same. Uh, same thing. This morning, I'm going to show what we can do when confronted with frightening or uncertain times. Let's look at Mark chapter 5 and begin with the situation. And it's one that is unpleasant. The Bible tells us that these men have made their homes in the mountains and in the tombs. And Luke points out they had no house, I meaning they were constantly dwelling within the mountains and the tombs. As we, as we will read through this in a moment, we'll find that they had developed a place that is very scary, very frightening, that no one ever came by that area because of these individuals. As we look at Mark chapter 5, look there in verse 1, we find the conditions of these men. In Mark chapter 5, again, Mark only points out one, so we'll talk about him here this morning. The Bible says, And they came to the other side of the sea, to the country of the uh, uh, Gadarenes. And we had come out of the boat, immediately there met him out of the tombs, a man with an unclean spirit, who had his dwelling among the tombs. Now again, Matthew, Matthew 8, 28 says that there were two men. And it's possible that a spirit possessing one man spoke for both men, meaning that one man just spoke for, the, for both of them. Now, as we know here in a moment, we'll find that even though it mentions here how this man had an unclean spirit, we'll find as Christ asked the question when he later, what is your name? We'll find that actually there were lots of demons dwelling within these two possessed men. He wore no clothes, as Luke also points out. Look at, we're going to be going back and forth if you haven't noticed already to Luke's account. If you look at Luke chapter 8, you look at Luke 8 and verse 27, because Luke is known as, uh, at least in my mind, to be uh, one who is very detailed. God says, when he stepped out on, on the land there in Luke 8, 27, there met him a certain man from the city who had demons, plural, demons. Luke again mentions a plurality, not just one, but many demons. He had demons for a long time, there in verse 27, and he wore no clothes, nor did he live in a house, but in the tombs. I mean, if you wanted to find a way to make a Hollywood movie or an idea for it, I mean, Mark 5, Luke 8, that's a pretty good, scary idea. 
And what's interesting, if you if you were to carry it out biblically, and it still is a very scary, uh, scary event that took place here. A man, he had multiple evil spirits, multiple demons there in verse 27 of Luke chapter 8. He has had them for a long time. He wore no clothes. We know what that means. He had nothing on, which is already something which, you know, caused you to stay away from that person. He did not live in a house, but in a tomb. So he's outside in tombs and also in the mountains, as Matthew will point out here as well. And he's wearing no clothes. He has multiple demons. He's been, been possessed for a long time. That's a very interesting situation, isn't it? Now we go back to Mark's account. Again, and, and you can find he had no clothes, lived in no house, but in the tombs. And we continue on here. We look at the latter part of verse 3 and also looking at verse 4. And no one could bind him, not even with chains. Now some might say, well, you know, the chains in the time of Christ probably weren't the same as ours today. Okay, but these guys are not exactly remedial students in creating chains. What do you think we're in the prisons, James? What do you think we're in their prisons? You think shackles were there? Yes. These men had moved individuals and prisoners for a long period of time, so they knew how to make a chain properly, correct? We don't know what force in which those chains could, could withstand, but he used them, ideally, because you cannot pull them apart. A normal human being cannot grab a chain unless you have some crazy bodybuilder and just pull it apart. They're made to last. If you get a chain that breaks apart, we say, well, that's a cheap chain, don't we? We want one that's going to last. And we find here in verse, verse 3, the Bible says, No one could bind him, not even with chains. tells us he had unnatural strength. Keeping in mind, he had multiple demons dwelling within him, both men, according to Matthew. And that no one could bind him. No one could control him. He couldn't put a chain on him and keep him secure in some place to keep him from terrifying people or from hurting himself. He couldn't do that. Because he had often, there verse 4, how much? Often, all the time. Been doing what? He's been bound with shackles. Shackles are those things that go around your ankles to bind your feet, keep you from moving very far, at least not very far, not very fast. And chains. And the chains have been pulled apart by him, and the shackles broken in pieces, neither could anyone tame him. You know, there are asylums where people go to try to get some type of treatment when they have mental problems, when they have mental disabilities, right? Things, they go to those places to try to find some way to help that person so they can have some type of a normal life. Verse 4 says that wasn't possible with this man. At least not in this state, right? No one could tame him. Neither could anyone tame him, verse 4. Now, feathers, or as the King James says, or shackles, again, refers to legs around your feet. The evil spirits or demons used a normal strength to break him from such bindings. And he was, if you look at Luke 8, verse 29, he says here, Luke adds, that he was actually kept under guard. He says there in the latter part of verse, uh, verse 20, or Luke 8, verse 29, he had, he had an unclean spirit to come out of, uh, let, me, let me back up a bit of myself. I believe that's right, I must have the wrong verse written down here. Yes, the most right. Look, uh, Luke 8, 29. And he was kept under guard. For he had often seized him, the unclean spirit. And he was kept under guard, bound with chains and shackles. He broke the bonds and was driven by the demons, by the demons into the wilderness. And so, again, he was kept under guard, meaning at least someone was watching him. Someone was keeping an eye on where this man, or these men, rather, were at all times. No one, as we find also, as we look at Mark, uh, could not go by that place without being harassed. And so no one would go by. The Bible says there in verse Mark 5, verse 5, that he was always day and night, and the night and day later, he was in the mountains and in the tombs, crying out and cutting himself with stones. Now, I debated picking a different graphic for this, but I thought, no, we can just read the text. We understand what it means for a person to be cut with stones. Some, some say, well, he could have been cutting his face. Some say he could have been cutting his arms, which can be dangerous because you get down towards your wrist and no bad things can happen. 
But he was injuring himself repeatedly. The Bible tells us there he was always in the mountains night and day. He was in the tombs crying out, which we can probably hear him from a distance. And he was cutting himself. Now think about the, the image that this paints. An uncold man who cannot be bound with chains or shackles. Shouting about, running about, cutting himself. And no one can do anything about it. No one can tame him, right? Until someone else steps off the boat, right? Mark chapter 5. And I've said this before, that Christ and the truth, in all reality of God's word, always is what changes any situation. And in Mark chapter 5, I say until Mark chapter 5, when Christ steps off the boat, this man was a very big problem. <clears throat> now I want you to think about this for a moment. If you have a very big problem in your life, and someone helps you to remedy that, to overcome that, to solve whatever that problem is, wouldn't you want to get to know that person better and possibly make sure they are an active part of your life and that they move forward? If you have someone in your home who has a health condition and someone volunteers to help you, you want to get to know that person better probably, don't you? We you know Mark's account and Luke's account and Matthew's as well. That when Christ remedies and solves this situation, that is not the response that he gets. Well, let's keep reading. We'll get to that more in just a moment. So, we have the condition of the man, of the men, rather. They're unclothed, they're in the mountains and in the tombs, they're not dwelling in, in any house, they're cutting themselves, they're shouting, they're running about, they're breaking any bond you try to place upon them. And then we get to Mark chapter 5, verse 6. You have the casting out of the demons. Remember, who was it that stepped off the boat in Mark 5 and verse 1? Christ. If anyone else has stepped off the boat and saw those crazy men, they could do nothing about it. The Bible tells us no one can take him, right? No one can bind him. But when Christ steps off the boat in Mark 5 verse 1, the scene is going to change and does so quite drastically. Looking at Mark chapter 5, looking at verse 6, we find the panic of the demons. Now keep in mind, the Bible tells us that these men have been possessed of these evil, by these demons or evil spirits for a long time. It doesn't give us a specific number of, of days or months or years, but a long time we get it. They have been harassed. They have been, they have been brutalized. They have suffered. The men themselves have been tormented for a very long time because of the demons dwelling within them. No fault of their own, right? The men were not doing this. The beings that were in possession of them, of them were doing this. Look at verse 6 of Matthew chapter 5. When he saw Jesus from afar, he ran and worshipped him. Now this is the, the being inside this person who is recognizing Christ. Now, it's interesting to look at verse 6. You think he ran and worshipped him. You think, well, that sounds a little... Odd, almost, right? Now, some commentators say this was an attempt at flattery by the man going and doing this. I don't really think that makes much sense to me, but anyway. Uh, this, this worship, though, seems to be more of an acknowledgement of Christ and a fearful recognition, a recognition of Him. If you look at Luke chapter 8, back again at verse 28, the same account here, he says, when he saw Jesus, he, he cried out, fell down before him with a loud voice. It doesn't say he worshipped him in Luke 8, verse 28. So I don't really believe that this is anything to do with an actual uh, try, attempt to worship Christ. But a fearful recognition, they recognize who Christ is, and they run and they fall down at his feet. And why did they do that? Look at verse 7. And he cried out a loud voice. So this seems to be a, a demon speaking for all of them, right? And said, What have I to do with you, Jesus, Son of the Most High God? What did that demon, what did the demons do just in verse 7? Did they know exactly who just got off the boat? Absolutely. It's interesting to me how quickly they realize who just came in their area. And everything changes the moment they realize who is here. They have been in possession of 
these two men for a long time. But when Christ comes on to the scene, literally arriving in their area, they immediately recognize who he is. They run and fall at his feet. Luke says there in Luke 8, verse 28, they fell down before him. What well, have demons to fear? Think about that for a moment. I won't, I won't, I won't give you any type of answer. I think we, you know, we have multiple answers to that and some speculation to that. But what do they have to fear? In short, the very Son of God who just arrived. And we find in verse 28, they fell down before him and said, reading from Luke's account, now Luke 8, verse 28, What have I to do with you, Jesus, Son of God, Son of the Most High God? I beg you, do not torment me. Matt, the Mark's account, Mark 5, verse 7, says the same thing. I implore you by God that you do not torment me. What does that statement imply about the power of Christ and the itty bitty power of the demons? They had nothing in comparison to what the Son of God possessed. They had no ability. Any ability they had just looked like nothing in the sight of the Son of God. Keeping in mind, they had been in possession of these two men for a long time. Caused them to do a lot of crazy and harmful things to themselves. Caused their lives to be wrecked for a very long time. But when Christ arrives, they recognize here who he is and implore him. They beg him, according to Luke's account, do not torment me. Who was the one in possession of real power? It was Christ, wasn't it? And we can say God. And, God. and God, through Christ, was going to show his power over the demons. In reality, Mark 5, he already has, hasn't he? They're already trembling before him. They're already begging him not to torment them there in verse 7. Now again, this should be a, a terrifying situation to the, to the normal human eye. Naked men running around unclothed for years, cutting themselves, doing all kinds of things, not being able to control them, scaring people. Christ is on the scene. You know, you can't scream and cry out and cut yourself at the same time when you're bowing down before Christ. What would happen? An eerie quiet would probably fall over the tombs, wouldn't it? I don't hear that crazy man crying out, do you? Why? Because Christ has struck fear in the hearts of these very men. Keeping in mind, in Mark chapter 5, up to this point, Christ has yet to say a single solitary word. The very presence of Christ struck fear into the, to, to the heart, you might say, of these beings, and they're already turning around and begging not to be tormented. Now, to say there is speculation upon what that means, there is, that's put it mildly, but there's a lot of speculation on what that means. Some may say, some believe that the do not torment me is reference to don't cast us out of this person because being cast out will cause us to will feel like being tormented. Or it could be a reference to where he might cast them out to. They will, in Mark's account, talk about, you know, don't send us out of the country. But in Luke's account, he uses the word the abyss, which actually is a reference to the deep, depending on what translation you're looking at. And, Looking at the Greek, it's that it brings it in, sending them completely off to a place in which they could never return. Either way, they're asking not to be tormented because they knew the power of Christ, which means he could do to them whatever he pleased. Right? These men have been fearful, have been caused fear among others, and now they are being having fear driven into them before Christ even others a word. No doubt this shows the recognition of the power of Christ that he feared he was there to torment them. Perhaps he cast him again like into the abyss as referenced in Luke 8 verse 31. The abyss can also be a reference to the bottomless pit we read about in Revelation chapters 9, 11, 17, and 20. 
But either way, whether you're talking about the abyss, the bottomless pit, or just casting them out to a different area of the world, whatever it may be, they recognize that he could torment them in whatever fashion. They recognize that he had power over them, and there was quite literally absolutely nothing that they could do about it. Those who were causing fear were now those who were in fear. You see how quickly Christ changes that. Those who were causing fear were now those who were in fear. The demons either view being cast out as being tormented or the place where they expect to be cast out to be tormenting them. But let's look further as we continue looking here. We're going to come back. I'm not going to forget verse 8, but we're going to, come, we're going to move ahead for just a moment. We'll come back to verse 8. In verse 9, here the Bible says, And he asked him, What is your name? And he answered, saying, My name is Legion, for we are many. Now, to me, that has always creeped me out a little bit, to say we are many, and there's more than just one of, one of us here. That's a little creepy. But keeping in mind, Christ, in <laughs> some sense you could say, was grossly outnumbered, wasn't he? There are many of us. Some say that perhaps the demons could be as many as 2,000. They get that because of the herd, herd of swine that is nearby. It could have been almost 2,000. Some say it could have been because the word legion is actually reference to the Roman army who numbered 6,000. They had a legion together. Whatever the case may have been, there were numerous demons within these two individuals. And the numerous demons, the legion, for we are many who are in great fear because of he who was sitting before them. We find in verse 10, the Bible says here, He also begged him earnestly that he would not send them out of the country. And again, Luke's account says, to the, into the abyss. Now a large herd of swine was feeding there near the mountain, so all the demons begged him. Now, now we have all the demons, verse 12, begged him to do what? Don't torment us. Just send us to the swine. Send us into the herd of nasty, disgusting pigs over here and just let us be. Now we know as we find there in verse 12, they beg him, saying, Since the swine, we may enter them. Now, obviously, Animals and humans are quite a bit different. We find when you're reading that the herd of swine can go down the mountain, go down the hillside into the water, and they all drown. What happens to demons beyond that, we do not know. The Bible doesn't say. Some would say, some commentators say, well, now they went into the abyss. The Bible doesn't say that. You can speculate that all you want, but that's not what the Bible says. Either way, the demons are no longer on the scene, and that is the point of what's happening here. The demons who had possessed these men for years and wreaked havoc upon the people where no one could pass by there were no longer there. Look at verse 13. At once, Jesus gave them what? Permission. I didn't think demons needed permission to act crazy, but apparently when they're being cast out by Christ and under complete terror, they have to ask, where do you want us to go? And they ask permission, begging him, and he permits them there in verse 13. Then the unclean spirits went out and entered the slide. There were about 2,000, and that's why some believe there's 2,000 demons. We never get a number, but there are many. And the herd ran violently down the steep place into the sea and drowned in the sea. Problem gone. I don't believe that took hours to do. I don't believe Christ would call and say, we're all going to have a big casting out party. We're going to cast all these demons out. No, he says actually in all reality, in that whole situation, he says very little. Because he doesn't have to. The Son of God has the power given him by God to do these things. The demons who are causing fear will now end fear. And he permits them to go to the slime which go down to the sea and they drown in the sea. 
There was no longer the sound of men crying out in the tombs, was there? In fact, as we'll see in a moment, if you look at verse 8, where he said to him, Come out of the man, unclean spirit. And in verse 9, he asked him, What is their name? When Christ cast out the demons, how soon does a miracle that Christ performed affect everyone involved? What I mean by that is, as soon as he cast out the demons, what happened to those two men? The Bible tells us what happens, right? Because we find them doing what? Clothed, sitting still, and in their right mind, which we'll talk about again here in a moment. So the moment they are cast out, those men no longer have the torments which they had before. They no longer are crying out, they no longer are trying to cut themselves, they no longer have the power of the influence of the evil spirits because they have been cast out by God. When the swine carried those, if you'll get that way, demons away, did those two men have anything to fear any longer? Christ quite clearly removed the problem, didn't he? You know, for us today, we have to remember he still does that, doesn't he? By obeying God's word, reading and studying our Bibles and seeing and recognizing what God wants us to do and obey it, he removes those problems in our lives because we will, when we see sin coming our way, temptation to do so, we can either overcome it, we can avoid it, we can recognize it, and when we do give in, we can repent of it. God has made a way for us to deal with those things, whatever may come down our path. It's interesting to me that in Mark's, as we read in Mark's account in all of them, Matthew and Luke's, when the demons come to fall down in, in, in the man, come to fall down before him, Christ really was face to face with evil, wasn't he? He was face to face with numerous demons possessing these men. If you picture that in your mind for one of these unclothed men who have been just marred by being cut by themselves over the years, the scars they must have had. If it was years to say that, however long it was. And all the blood stains they may have had upon them. And we find in Mark's account that Christ, and this is where other accounts, that Christ stood the evil to the, stood up to the evil to its face, had the power within him and cast it out. And those two men who were abused for so long were now free from that hardship. You know, in many ways, we think about this for us today. When we obey the gospel, doesn't much of a hardship go away? I mean, granted, we're going to have hard times as a Christian, but the pain and the temptation to live worldly should go away, shouldn't it? Let's look next at the fear that would happen. I'm getting ahead of myself. But let's go look at Mark chapter 5, looking at verse 18. Excuse me, Mark chapter 5, verse 14. What did they fear? The people we find in Mark 5, verse 14, the Bible says, So those who fled, he fed the swine fled. And those who kept the, the swine ran off and told it in the city and the country. They went out to see what, 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 what it was that happened. Now those who were keeping the swine had also seen what had happened, hadn't they? Can you imagine seeing that? Sitting off around your, around your hogs there and watching these crazy men all of a sudden rush towards Christ. Fall down, they're speaking to one another for a short period of time, and all of a sudden these two men start acting normal, and you heard the swine rush down the mountain and into the sea. We find in verse 14, they had they told them the city the country where they had country what they had seen, what they had seen to bring them out, see what had happened, verse 15. Then they came to Jesus and saw the one who had been demon possessed and had the legion. So they're looking at the man who had been demon possessed and had the multiple demons. Verse 15, what happens? He was sitting 
He wasn't running around yelling and crying out like he was before, was he? He was clothed, and notice this, and in his right mind, he was acting normal. He was acting normal. Which to them, look at verse 15, and they were afraid. They didn't expect that. You don't expect someone who's had this long time period of, 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 of anguish to all of a sudden just be sitting in the right mind, not acting crazy anymore. Look at verse 16. And those who saw it told them how it had happened to him who had been deep possessed and about the swine. So there are those there who had seen it. They tell them what had happened. They tell him, uh, they, they told them how it happened to him who had been deep possessed and about the swine. They repeated everything they had seen. Now, think about this for a moment. If you have a rowdy gang in your town, and a new sheriff comes to town and cleans it all up, <coughs> would your response be, hey, get out of here, go somewhere else? No, I think your response would be, let's give you a raise and keep you right here. But that's not what happens with Christ, is it? And instead of begging him to stay, look at verse 17. Then they begged, they began to plead with him to depart from their region. Some, some say, well, perhaps they thought he would turn to use his power against them. If he wanted to hurt them, all he'd do is leave those two crazy men alone, didn't he? But why would you cast out demons and then turn to hurt someone else? Well, that's not what would happen at all, was it? It doesn't make logical sense. If you look at eight, uh, Luke chapter 8, looking at verse 37, I didn't realize that clock was moving about that quickly. Luke 8, verse 37. Look what he says here. Then the whole multitude of the surrounding region of the, of the gathering asked him to depart from them, for they were seized with great fear, and he got to the boat and returned. You know, people are petrified of you. It's really going to be hard to try to preach to them the gospel, isn't it? It doesn't mean someone might come after him to preach to them the gospel. But if they're afraid he would be near you, how are you going to tell them the truth? The Bible tells us there in verse 37, he got to the boat and returned. I think in many ways to me, that's Christ being merciful because he didn't have to do any of that. But he did because they were petrified. What do you fear? What do you fear? You know, the men in Mark 5 could have possibly feared a repeat to the very same problem. You know, they may have feared that maybe somehow demons, maybe not the same ones, but maybe other demons might come and possess them again. <clears throat> I'm sure they had great fear never having these things to happen to them again. You look at Mark 5, look at verse 18. And when he got to the boat, he who had been demon possessed begged him that he might be with him. What do you want to do? I want to say with you, logical response. You can do that. You spare me. You save my life. You save his life. We want to stay with you. You know, in a very real sense today, much like the men who wanted to follow Christ for comfort and safety, we too should have the same desire. We too should want to follow Christ because when we do that, we will have safety because we are obedient and we will have what? Comfort because we are with Christ. Look at Psalm 119 and verse uh, 50. This is my comfort, my affliction, for your word has given me life. What gives him life and during his affliction, during his difficulty? The word of God. The same should be spoken of us today. When hard times come, just give me the Bible, right? The song we sing sometimes. Just give me the Bible. Give me the word of God. That will give me comfort. You know, Christ overcame the power of Satan. You go back to Mark chapter 5. You remember the fear of the legion in Mark chapter 5? Verse 7, I implore you that you not torment me. The wicked fear God because he cannot be defeated. The faithful can find peace in remembering the power of God. If the demons begged him not to torment him, not to torment them, 
Do we worship and follow an awesome God? Yes. Some lessons for us today. Through God's Son, we have the victory. The demons and the thought of God and His Son tremble, as we were reminded there in James 2 and verse 19. The Bible tells us the demons who believe and tremble. Why? How do we know that? Because we saw them when they possessed those two men and Christ stepped off the boat, they freaked out, didn't they? They fell down before him and begged him not to torture them. Why? Because someone far greater than them just arrived. Friends, someone far greater than us wants us to have heaven as our home. In order for us to do that, we have to obey the gospel. God has given us the pathway to heaven. We just have to follow it. What are we to fear? You know, in, in this account of the demons falling down before, the, before Christ, what's interesting is that was seen by others. They knew the man was demon-possessed. And you see a demon-possessed man fall down in fear before Christ. Did that tell you something? About the awesome power of the Son of God? About the awesome power of God in general? What have we to fear? As I said before, our God is an awesome God. We are reminded in Psalm 111, verse 9, the Bible says, He has sent redemption to His people. He has commended His covenant forever. Holy and awesome is His name. The King James translates the word awesome there, reverend. Holy and reverend is His name. Or holy, is, holy and awesome is His name. We worship an awesome God. One who is not afraid of demons. One who is not afraid of the demon possessed. One who cares for the souls of men. Do you consider the power of God in difficult times? You know, those who fear God, those who have fear, should only be those who are living in unrighteousness. If we're living righteously, we have nothing to fear. But what do we, do we consider the power of God in difficult times? You know, the people of Mark 5 saw power and fear, and, and let's consider it and be thankful for the power of God, not be afraid of it. You know, without God and His Word, or excuse me, with God and His Word, rather, we can face down anything that may come. You know, notice how Christ was received after the, after when, he, when He left that region. God tells us He got to the boat, right? And he, he returned. Look how he was received at the very next event. If you look at Luke chapter 8, verse 40. So it was when, so it was when Jesus returned, and the multitude welcomed him, for they were all awaiting, or all waiting, rather, for him. Why were they waiting for Christ? Oh, because he's the one. You remember the next occasion of Luke chapter 8, verse 40 and following? He performed yet another miracle, healing another person. But the response is different. It wasn't fear. It was, let's get him here quickly. We're all waiting for Christ. It would seem that by them waiting for him there, that they perhaps heard he was coming back or saw the boat from a distance, wherever they had been, and they were literally waiting for him. Friends, we should have that same eagerness. They knew his power, and they did not fear. You know, do we greet the Lord's day the way they greeted Christ in Luke 8, verse 40, they were just waiting for it. Do we look for the Lord's day and we're just waiting for it to get here because we're so ready to worship God together? We're so ready to study the Word of God together. We're so ready to be together, to think about and to contemplate all those things that God has done for us, to offer up prayers to Him, to confess our sins to Him. Asking others perhaps to pray for us as well. Do we look forward to that time? Because we should. You know, you think about Luke chapter 8, verse 40. The Bible said, The multitude welcomed him, but they're all waiting for him. Do we, are we living our lives in such a way that we can be prepared to meet Christ on the judgment day? You know, the faithful Christian should look forward to the judgment day because we know that we are, if we are living faithful before God. That's the day that we get to go home, right? But for those who are not, that day is totally different. The demons in Mark 5 
<laughs> they weren't prepared, right? How could they be? They met the one who would send them wherever he wanted, and they begged not to be tortured. And on the day of judgment, if we're not right in the sight of God, no begging is going to change anything. <clears throat> we must be right in the sight of God. So we, we meet him on the day, meet Christ on the day of judgment, we can do so with a welcoming smile, glad to see our Lord and Savior. Let's not fear that day. Let us not fear as Christians anything that comes our way. Because no matter what happens in this world, no matter what happens in our community around us, God is always in control. You know, you think about Mark chapter 5, those events. Those individuals, tried as they might, could not control that situation. But I will tell us, he broke everything. You're running around screaming and hollering, they couldn't do anything about it. They could not control him. You know, God is always in control. <clears throat> no matter how many people around us are shouting and doing things which are immoral and ungodly, God is still in control. Let us not allow them to distract us from being prepared on the judgment day. Because we want to be those who, like here in Luke chapter 8, when, we met, when they met Christ, they were welcoming him. Let's make sure that we're doing all the weekend so we can be prepared for the judgment day. This morning, as you think about these things, you think about your own life, think about your life before God, being asked for prayers, asked for current words of encouragement, whatever it may be, we'd like to do so. Let's go to be saying and sing the song that's been selected. <laughs> 